Welcome to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament book of Psalms. Uh, we're a day late getting this out. I actually recorded it all yesterday and uh, there was some kind of a glitch in the recording of it and I could not recover the files. So um, if you were looking for it last night, sorry, um, I put it off till this morning, kind of frustrated uh, trying to use a recovery uh, program that just would not be able to recover the the. Uh, the files that had been corrupted. So anyway, such is technology. As much as we enjoy it, uh, there are times when it rebels and we are kind of powerless to fix it. So um, we're picking up at Psalm 129 and uh, we'll work through probably Psalm 131. That's what I recorded last night. And what I want to make sure that I do here, um, and I I, I know I've said this a number of times, so some of it might sound a little repetitious, but it may very well be that there are people who are listening to this one who haven't listened to any of the studies so far, and I want to cover a couple of things very quickly. First of all, we are in a section of the Psalms known as the Songs of Ascent, and uh, they are from Psalm 120 through 134. And as tradition holds, these would be uh, Psalms that would have been sung as they would be walking up to the temple and uh, on their way to Jerusalem. So if you've ever been there, if you've been to Israel, from just about every direction, the Temple Mount itself is something that you would walk up to. Certainly from the west, from the south, uh, from the east, from the north, it's kind of almost level, but uh, you would be walking up to the, the temple. And even when you get there to walk up to it, it's still an elevated uh, position. So there's always going to be steps to get up into it. So. There are some of the the um, psalms themselves that are clearly written from a much later date, and we'll have examples of that today. So if the tradition is correct, and these were ones that they would have sung as they'd be walking up, some of the psalms would have already been written, because uh, a couple of them that we've gone through have been attributed to David. And so... Um, it would give the impression that uh, that these would be uh, being read, though penned much earlier. So I don't really, you know, it doesn't change anything about the construction of them. It doesn't change anything about them that they were written specifically for this person because they span a great deal of time. So um, whatever it may be and whether or not the tradition is correct, you can definitely tell that there are some parts of this that, and some of these Psalms that Man, if you were if you were walking up to the temple, and if it was at a time of the feasts and all of that, especially if you've gone through difficult times in the country and in the nation, and uh, clearly by looking at their history, there are things that God had done in and through them that were nothing short of miraculous. So the idea that you would want to uh, include that as part of your pilgrimage, if you would, of recounting that God has done these great things for you as a nation, all of that works really, really fine. So I don't have a problem with them being referred to as the Psalms of Ascent. They were clearly not written specifically for that purpose, at least all of them. Um, but the idea that they could have been assembled at a, at a later time, you'll notice that they're all very, well, not all of them, but uh, most of them are very short uh, relative to the rest of the Psalms. So that would make it kind of simpler if you're trying to remember them and recite them as you're going up. So with all of that said, interesting and uh, they're fantastic Psalms. In fact, these ones here that we're going to look at today are just they're phenomenal uh, as far as a person to read them. And uh, this is the second part of what I wanted to get to, because I, I know, again, I, I know I probably sound like a broken record, but I really do believe that when it comes to uh, Old Testament, if we're reading it and we're trying to make application and uh, remember it and, and, you know, being careful to look at the text and think somehow it, it may speak to our times and to the church, I want to be sure that what we're looking at and what we're reading is something that genuinely does. Because there are times that God will say things particular, and it really is, sometimes it's very date sensitive, time sensitive, very specific to a particular occasion or something that had taken place. And that means that the audience is much, much more narrow. And so um, the the probably best example that I could ever, ever give, and I know that I use this one quite often, um, is the uh, the Second Chronicles seven fourteen, where uh, God says, "If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, humble themselves, seek my face, and turn from their wickedness, then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land." So you hear that quoted all the time, and yet 
um, when you go back to look at it, it's God giving a response to something that Solomon had prayed in chapter 6, and it was at the dedication of the temple. If you read the context of all of it, read chapter 6 and chapter 7 in their entirety, and you'll realize that God is giving an answer about the children of Israel, and about that place, about the temple, about the law, and the things that they were responsible to do before him. And this is God speaking directly to that group of people in response to the prayer that was offered on their behalf half. So the idea that, that God would heal the land is speaking specifically about Israel, and if they come to their senses after their rebellion, then God would do that. So this implies a number of things, that there are people that are a covenant, uh, a covenant people, and that they have turned to wickedness, they themselves, and when God judges them for it, if they will repent and turn back to him, then he will respond. Now, for people trying to make that about America, none of it fits. We're not a covenant people. God made no covenant with the United States. Were there people who were uh, very much um, believers a at the time of the founding? Absolutely, we have their writings, we know a lot about them. But God never made a covenant with the United States. So that doesn't fit properly. If we're trying to say it's about the church, well, the church should not be in a place of wickedness and a place of repentance because of their rebellion and idolatry. That's the context. So it really doesn't fit anywhere. Now, the idea that people could come before God if there is a, a time of waywardness and asking him for forgiveness, sure, that works. It's on an individual level, but for an entire country and an entire people, it really is very, very specific to Israel. Now, with all of that said, the the, the the things that are pretty easy for us to know how to apply those things, is it God speaking when he says the things that he says, like in Second Chronicles, as opposed to what we read here, where it's the psalmist pouring out their heart to the God whom they love and they're grateful to him, even if the nation you know, might have a time of real waywardness when these things are written, or they're coming back at a time once God has restored them, which a couple of these really give that impression. This is really the person writing at the time based on their knowledge of who God is and what he has done, their, their knowledge of, of uh, what their, their history is because of him. All of those things are in operation here. So it's the person speaking um, to God and giving thanks to him or recognition of some sort. That makes it a whole different matter. If it's God speaking specifically to a group of people, we want to be careful that we understand that history. If it's one of the people at the time um, and they're, they're pouring out their heart of, of thanksgiving and love and adoration and worship to God, that puts us all kind of in the same boat. And we have a better understanding, of course, of who God is, as we're going to see in the text here today. We've got a better understanding of how God interacts, what is redemption, what is salvation, what has God done. We have, I mean, just light years different than what the people here in Psalms would have seen. Remember, they're under the law. They're offering sacrifices. They're having to do so repeatedly. It's a never-ending cycle of sin and, and uh, repentance and sacrifice. It's just again and again and again and again all the time. With us, we don't have any concept of that. Jesus has died once for all. Sin is no longer an issue that could separate us from God for eternity as believers. If we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in his sacrifice, sin is washed away. It is removed from the account of the believer. So we can walk in that newness of life. Now, it doesn't mean that we just coast. It means that we keep our eyes on him, grateful for the work that he has done, and we grow in our knowledge of who he is. So that doesn't mean that we save ourselves. He's done the work of salvation, but we're not having to repeatedly offer sacrifices again and again and again. It's been taken care of. So from our perspective, our relationship to God is considerably different from theirs because we have reconciliation in the person of Jesus Christ. They would be reconciled by an offering for sin, but it had to be done repeatedly. So it's, it's a whole different world. When we read the things that we do, once again, it's best for us to understand the history as much as we can. 
And if we can place it in a particular time frame, that's great. But at the end of it, whatever is being said here, we always look at it through the filter of the New Testament. And how would we maybe express it in ways, or better yet, how would we understand the same principles being spoken of here for people within the church? And I think that that'll become really obvious when we look at these three that we're looking at today. They're magnificent. And so i um, very much looking forward to doing these ones with you. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll jump right in at Psalm 1. 29. Father, we thank you for the time that we can spend in your word. We would ask that by the work of the Holy Spirit, you'd open our eyes and our understanding to what we see here. We give to you all thanks and pray that you would be glorified through the teaching of your word, that we would grow in our knowledge of you. And uh, so we give you all thanks and pray that you would guide us through this study of your word in Jesus' name. All right, so glasses. <laughs> Going to need those. Um, Psalm 129. It's it's eight verses. Let's just go ahead and read them. We'll do this with all three of, uh, of the Psalms. We've been doing this lately. Read the entirety of it, and then we'll go back and look at the individual pieces of it. So it says um, in Psalm 129, verse 1, many a time have have they afflicted me from my youth? And so let Israel now say, many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, and yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed on my back, they made long furrows, uh, or made their furrows long. The Lord is righteous, he has cut into pieces the cords of the wicked. Let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back. Let them be as grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor he who binds sheaves his arms. Neither let those who pass by them say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We will bless you in the name of the Lord. So this is just an interesting passage for us to look at considering where we are right here right now in human history um we are right now you know just watching the news waiting for the retaliation that iran has promised against israel now i'm recording this on a uh, on a tuesday i usually record this on monday and so it's the beginning of august in 2024 and we know that that the middle east is really on the brink of what could potentially be a very, very large escalation, depending on what Iran does. And of course, it, it really does create a, a great interest for Bible prophecy people because Iran <clears throat> has such a significant uh, role in, in Ezekiel's uh, war that he describes that's never to this date taken place. So with that being said, of course, we're all watching this. What will be the next thing? Russia is, is making lots of noise. They're giving uh, um, assistance and uh, and uh, defensive weapons to um, to Iran to safeguard the capital Tehran and other places, and so Russia being involved with Iran and the, the saber rattling of Turkey about a potential invasion. We watch all these things going on, and it's fascinating, uh, troubling of course because of the human toll. But to watch these things taking place in front of us is really quite amazing. Now, as we read this particular psalm. It, it is really kind of looking back, and again, it would give the impression, it, this wouldn't be a psalm that would seemingly fit if it was written, say, at David's time, because there haven't been the enemies that have plowed and done the things that they've done, and that God has broken their bonds and all those kind of things. This would fit really nicely after, say, the Babylonian captivity, and that God had broken those bonds. Um, it wouldn't fit so well up in the north, because um, Assyria took out the, the northern tribes and really they weren't released from those bonds that just kind of they disappeared now there were people that stayed and lived in the north but the thing was with the syria there were there were the assyrians who stayed behind and there was really an intermingling of the people in the northern parts the southern tribes um, primarily judah and benjamin and whoever from the other tribes came and lived in that territory uh, lived and the the assyrians would have taken them out too had god not intervened at the time of hezekiah and isaiah but they were still nonetheless later on, not at the hands of the Assyrians, but the Babylonians taken away because of their rebellion. Kind of really what we were talking about at the beginning with Second Chronicles, uh, that really was a fulfillment that had taken place because there was at that point the destruction of the temple at the hands of the Babylonians and everything that God had prophesied and said would take place in Second Chronicles 7 really took place. 
So they come back from that captivity. That fits pretty nicely of where this might very well be, that they were taken away captive, but God broke those bonds. And so took them from their captivity, returned them to the land as he said he would at the time that he said he would. Starting at 70 years of captivity with Zerubbabel, they begin to come back. And then decades later, you start to get the, the second and third waves of it with uh, Nehemiah and then ultimately with Ezra. So with all of that as the historical background, that kind of fits here. This would fit probably after the Babylonian captivity, but I'm not going to get into an argument about it. It just kind of it fits as far as the things that are being said here. So it's with that backdrop that we understand what's being said here. And again, it's just so appropriate when we take a look at the world around us that God will always have Israel's back. The world doesn't understand it. When you watch all of the things that are being said, and especially by the enemies, and they're predicting, you know, finally Israel's gone too far here, we're going to go and wipe them out. And that's most of the Muslim world that's engaged in this, that cares about it, are just saying, okay, finally, we're just going to rid ourselves of the Jewish people. And under normal circumstances, we might look at that and say, well, they, they certainly could do it. They have enough personnel to do it. And Israel's a small little place, and you have these massive countries all around them who can't stand them. Uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't be just completely wiped out. But we've got what we have here in the text, and we know that God won't allow that to take place. In fact, those who come against them will be humiliated like they have been countless times prior. And again, it comes at great human cost because the reason that, that nations could move against them is because they had turned their back on God, and God said that this would be the case. Now, interesting dynamic where we are here in this particular point in time in, in the world history, or in world history. The nation itself, I've been there a number of times, and uh, we'll go back there as soon as, uh, as uh, safety things permit, should the Lord tarry and, and leave us here to do so, we'll go back and, and see it again. But with that being said, the uh, the nation, there are many there who are genuinely seeking after the Lord, some of whom are believers, brothers and sisters in Jesus, uh, others who are very much orthodox and care you know, greatly about things of Torah and whatnot like that. They're just not fully understanding. But most of the of the nation, or much of the nation, I should say, is very much secular. So God has brought them back into the land, but they are not walking with him. And this is why they have so much trouble from the outside. And yet God preserves them nonetheless. They survived 48. They survived 67. They survived 73. Of course, any of those three should have been or could easily have been the end of the Jewish, the Jewish nation. But God wasn't going to allow that to happen. So Israel remains as they always have, even in times of displacement, God has regathered them and oversees them now because we're, we're getting close to the time that the Bible predicts that God wraps things up. And eventually everything that we know as we know it uh, comes to an end and God begins the process of, of the forever kingdom. So with all that being said, interesting what we see here in this particular part of the psalm from a, a historical perspective, say 2,500 years ago, round figures, um, how interesting is it that we read this in light of what we see in the world around us? So this is, there are, there are two views of um, how this is being presented. Is this being written as though it was the nation of Israel, if it became a person that, that Israel could have written this letter or this psalm? Or is it that the psalmist themselves speaks of this in the first person, but then calls out to the rest of the nation in the third person and says, and let the nation repeat after me, because it's a repetition. So either way, it works fine. It doesn't change the outcome of it, but it, it really does change a little bit about how it's being said. Is it the nation as a whole speaking as a nation, or is it the individual speaking and then the nation kind of coming in in a way of chorus? Doesn't change the, the inner pieces of it, it's just how do you view it from the opening verse uh, of, the, of the psalm. Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, and we don't know who they are, 
but there are plenty of candidates. If we're thinking post-Babylonian, um, the Babylonians came, there were three separate times that they came against Jerusalem a, a, over a span of 19 years. It was that third one that they were actually taken away. It was uh, 597 or 586, um, where they were taken away. Um, and that was the beginning of that, of that 70 years. So it says, many a times they have afflicted me from my youth. So now, and that, that's the transition, let then, or however you'd want to word that, it's just a transition. Let Israel now say, Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. That's the important part. Who is the they? We're not sure. We have candidates of who they would be. I've laid out what that is. I don't want to be too repetitious. But here's what we do know. They afflicted, if it's Babylon or if it's the Assyrians or whoever you want to pick, the Philistines, doesn't matter. They have always attempted to do this. Nations have attempted to do this over the years, and they have always failed. So who the they is, we don't know, but they have failed. And so even in our modern times, <clears throat> we can say they were displaced by the Romans. And that displacement lasted for 1900 years as a government that who the Jews had a representation, if you will, in the way of a government that they had that for for you know for all their history until being displaced in Jerusalem as the the capital and as the people there was a displacement that happened at 70 AD were Jews still living in the land of Israel of course but it was always from that time on it was still a vassal state of somebody else and most of the time from that history after 70 AD when you go through the ages nobody really cared about the place it was just one of those plundered places and they were gone from it but the the jewish people understanding it's their homeland wanted to be uh, repopulating it and wanted it to be their capital again wanted everything to begin the the whole process that started really in the 19th century so the 1800s into the 1900s mid-century 1948 they actually establish a nation once again after a displacement of almost 1900 years so unprecedented in world history, now look at them. They are, they are uh, an impressive nation in that part of the world, though they are small, they're dwarfed by the nations around them, but the nations around them have not been able to defeat them. All of that fits perfectly because of what we know of God's promises to them. So with that being said, as we look at this, whoever they were in the past, they have tried, but they've failed. They could not displace permanently the people of Israel, and they've tried it here in our modern history. And they're trying it yet again as we are reading this. There are attempts to do it all over again for now the fourth time since they've been in the land for, what, 76 years? Interesting. So that says, uh, but they have not prevailed against me. Now the plowers, verse three, they have plowed on my back. They have made fur their furrows long. There's two ways that this has been presented. One is if it's the individual, is it the stripes on their back figuratively, literally? Is it that they have have um, scourged and, and, you know, cut into their flesh and, and made furrows long using the imagery of like what happens when they plow a field? Or are they saying it more in the literal sense that these people from other countries have come in and planted fields and plowed and all that stuff? And, and the idea that it's on their back is that it was done to them. If it's the nation of Israel figuratively riding itself. Uh, writing about itself rather these would be the people who have come from other countries and you know made crops and all the rest of it so there's a couple of ways that you can look at it and in either case it works fine because we know the scourging of the uh, of the nations for the individuals as slaves uh, and as as vassals and, and uh, people under their control or if it's the land speaking of itself of, of having it being cultivated by foreigners so it says in verse 4 but the Lord is righteous and he has cut in pieces the cords of the wicked so let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back let them be as the grass on the housetops which wither uh, before it grows up now interestingly enough it's that god has intervened and cut their cords every time that there has been that that uh the the subjugation of god's people from the times of moses at the hands of the egyptians 
or if it's the Babylonians and uh, and them taking away the people captive in a very, you know, uh, in a very open kind of a way. God ended up bringing them back. It, it, it just happens. God's broken the bonds at his time and on his time and brought the people back. So it says, now let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back. And this is the interesting thing. And, and even now, my prayer is that the nation of Israel and the people that live there would put aside the secularism and all of the division that there is in the political sense like we have in this country. It is definitely going on there. And that they would start to look to the hand of the Lord and that they would recognize how often he has taken them from the place of what would have been their destruction and preserve them and cause them to thrive. So the idea that God would not only break the bonds, but the people who hate Israel, that those people would be put to open shame. It's kind of like that everything would be seen and that God would humiliate the, the enemies as he has done so often. So may that be the case now and that people would begin to pray in, in the nation kind of like this, remembering the God who has brought them back. So many of them are completely oblivious to his hand. They look at themselves. They're very much self-assured. Look at what we have done, all the rest of it. And great. They are industrious, incredible people there in, in the nation. But you cannot separate the idea that God has given them favor. And I wish that they saw that in, in more, uh, more large uh, numbers. So with that being said, here is what the writer of Psalms recognizes and acknowledges. Let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back. And then may they be like this is what you see in verses six, seven, and eight. Let them be as the grass on the housetop with which withers before it grows, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor he who binds sheaves in his arms. And so um, we can think of it, it's not very much like this, but we, we see it in other places in the world where houses are built and the tops of them may be uh, different types of, of materials, but it's a place where grass would be able to grow. It just can't grow very abundantly and it doesn't last very long. It might have enough dirt for it to sprout up, but it can't stay very long. It, it pops up, but then it dies off. You see it sometimes in rain gutters and places where dirt and water can accumulate and something green might sprout up, but it doesn't last very long. Basically the same thing here. Let them be like that kind of grass that pops up on the roof. It pops up, but it doesn't last very long. There's not enough of it for the people who might gather it up for like burning or doing whatever. There's not enough for them to fill in their hands, let alone the people who might come as the harvesters that would put it into sheaves. There's not going to be enough of it. So let those who hate Zion be like that. It's withered. It doesn't work. It's not big enough in volume to even be, be trifled with. Just leave it as it is. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, amount to anything. Neither, and these are blessings that would happen. If people are walking by, if people are taking notice of a particular person or a home where everything seems to be in its place and obviously God's hand uh, is prospering the people there, this would be like what the greetings would be. So, neither let those who pass by them say the blessing of the Lord be upon you, which is a recognition that it's already taking place. And then secondly, we will bless the name of the Lord, uh, that way of giving thanks because God has shown favor to the person that's being spoken of here. And it's, again, it's just that, that way of recognizing that God and his hand, God's hand rather, is is. Uh, supporting the person and giving blessing to them. So this is a way of saying those people who hate Israel, never let it be said of them that the Lord is prospering them. By, by contrast, let them be like the grass that withers and that never is even accounted for because it's so, it's so minuscule, it's so unimportant, it never, uh, never amounts to anything. So I would love it if these kinds of Psalms would be read continually by the by the people of Israel and that they would recognize the hand of God that is, has not only brought them into the land, but sustains them when they have no reason to, to uh, understand their, or no, no, reason, no reason, no way to explain away the favor that they've been shown and that God has sustained them the way that he has. So Psalm 130, out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice and let the ears, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. 
I will wait for the Lord. My soul waits and his word in his word. I do hope my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch in the morning. Yes, more than those who watch in the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord for with the Lord, there is mercy and with him there is abundant redemption. He has uh, he shall redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. Now, there is a very, very interesting transition that happens here. Um, when it comes to the person who's writing this of recognizing that there is the physical things that they might see and there are are you know physical blessings that there are there but this is much different the redemption that's being spoken of here is much more looking at it from a spiritual level and this is where we would want to be very careful when we start to look at this and say how does this apply in our modern days because it's very very much one of those kinds of passages that a, a church, someone in a church could write and just their reflection of how, how good God is. So the first part of this in verse one, this is out of the depths. I have cried to you, O Lord. So the depths would give this impression of being submerged in the depths of water, something that's been flooded and overflown just in that, that way of being overwhelmed and sunk to the bottom of things. No one would be able to hear the cries of someone like that and uh, the, the water would drown it out. So the, the person here, whatever the circumstances are in their lives, it's as though they've drowned. It's that they're in the depths of the deepest of things and no one can hear them, but they cry out to the Lord who can hear. So the implication is that when no one can help, when situations are so overwhelming and you're being drowned in them that you cry out to the Lord. And the second part of it in verse two, Lord, hear my voice and let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. So the supplication has to have something to do with looking at the condition of things and then crying out for some kind of help and assistance from the Lord. And then having that assurance that not only does he hear, but that he can also answer. So church, here we are, 21st century, 2024. If you were to write this and put it into your own, well, better yet, we wouldn't have to rewrite this. This is something that we can say in our times of trouble, do we have the same kind of uh, assurance that we can cry out to God even in our trouble? And not only that he's able to hear, but he's also able to answer. So making your supplication before him, which is getting into the specifics there. The prayer is already in, implied because it's I've cried out. That's prayer. The supplications. Let me get into the details. God, you already know them, but let me recount them before you and seeking him for some kind of remedy. So in verse three, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? What an amazing statement that's there. So the supplication and everything else has to have something to do with some kind of sin of some sort, because again, context really kind of helps us. If the person is crying out, looking for some kind of remedy, and then instantly transitions here in verse three to the idea of iniquity, then that kind of gives us a, a hint that there's something there, but we don't have the specifics. We frankly don't need them. This is a way of just though recognizing the incredible holiness of God and that the temporal sinful man who can cry out to a holy God and seek remedy. And so in the New Testament sense, in our day and age, this is really poignant stuff that's being written here. The recognition of God's holiness and yet him condescending to man and saying, what can I do to to, you know, to help you? How can I assist you? And we know that by providing a, a savior for us and a sacrifice that would settle the matter of sin, he's done everything that he could possibly do. But at the time that this is written, they don't have that same assurance. So let us read this and say, goodness, in the in the New Testament sense, what we know as far as what God has revealed to us through his son, this takes on a whole different complexion. But it does make this incredible statement. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? So if you took a little, you know, if you, a ledger, took out a ledger and kind of counted all of the things that we've done, the most righteous person has no ability to stand before a holy God because we are imperfect. So it's the recognition that if you were to take the time to, to list all of our iniquities, no one could stand before you saying we're righteous, we're acceptable. All of us are sinners. It's just a great admission, something that we should all remember. But here's by the, 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 the way of looking at it in 
from God's perspective. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And this is just a, a statement of fact. No one could stand before you and claim their own righteousness. But you, Lord, you are, and you are righteousness, and you have provided a way where we could be reconciled to you. So there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. But let's remember what that forgiveness came at what at, and at what price. It was not only the recognition of the things of the law, but it was the innocent being offered up for the sin of the guilty. So the, the sacrificial system, repetitious, over and over and over again, always having to be repeated because it was never finished. So all the feasts, all the sacrifices, all of that stuff had to be done year round to deal with the matter of sin. But in the church sense, that's a once and for all thing. In the person of Jesus, we have the perfect sacrifice that God would honor and say, nothing more needs to be sacrificed because his sacrifice is complete and perfect. It will not need to be repeated. So our view of this is so different from theirs, but it still required the, the uh, offering of the perfect for the imperfect, the innocent for the guilty. It has not changed. But so... No one could stand before God in their own righteousness, but since God is forgiving, he is offered away. So they recognized it. Theirs was pertaining to the law. Ours is looking at the person of Jesus. So here's what the person says, um, that you may be feared at the end of verse four, that idea of awe and respect, worship, adoration. That's the, the, that's the kind of fear that's being spoken of here. Not being afraid of him, but being in awe of him. Different word, or same English word, but different meaning. And really you could, uh, even in the original languages, it can mean a literal fear, or it can mean that one of awe and respect. And remember, as you're reading this, this is not a person who's afraid of God. This is a person who is thankful to him that he has offered away, that he is one who forgives. So then verse five, this is the this is the condition of heart as they're awaiting this forgiveness and the, the ultimate outcome of it. So verse five, I will wait, or I wait rather for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word do I hope. So this is a person's soul is really everything that makes them who they are. So heart, soul, that everything that is in me waits for the Lord. That's a way of anticipation. I'll be hopeful. And in a place of expectation, that's the waiting of the soul. And it says, and in your word, I will find hope. That helps us to understand. It's not just saying to them, it would be the, the 39 books or depending on when it was written, it could even be uh, less than that. But it's just the, the things that God has spoken, whatever they might have in front of them at the time, it's not just speaking about the volume of what's there in the book, but it's really in the answer to the petition, the supplication. God, here, let me lay it all out for you, what's troubling me. It's the things that God says, when a person will come to me and cry out and pour out their heart, here's what I will do. So this person that's writing this is clinging to the idea that God has spoken of what he would do for a person and in a person's life in their condition. So that hopefulness, this, these verses are all about the expectation. I cried out, verse one, praying that God would hear, knowing that none of us are righteous, but that he offers forgiveness to us. So in that, he knows that to be the truth. And in that, he will wait. And in that, he finds that God has already promised. In that, he will place his hope. I hope you, church, let's pay attention to this because this really does speak to where we are as well. So my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch in the morning and more than those who watch in the morning. It's a repetition. So the people who uh, have been up all night, uh, seemingly it's, this uh, seems to be an allusion to those who uh, would, would keep vigil uh, in the nighttime making sure that if there's danger, that there's people who are alerted to it, the, the night watchman. But by the time that the morning comes around, their shift, if you will, is kind of over and they're desiring to, you know, to move on to the next thing, but they've been up all night kind of watching. This person here writing this says, I'm more vigilant than even that person that is awaiting the dawn so that things can get, you know, onto the, the daytime, the different type of a schedule. It just really kind of goes to that idea of here's my vigilance. I'm going to wait on the Lord and my soul is going to wait and I'm going to hope in his word. And I'll be eager for the outcome more than the person who is waiting for dawn. So verse seven, O Israel, hope in the Lord. And here's where it becomes that, that kind of 
may this be the case. And it's an imperative hope in the Lord for with the Lord, there is mercy and with him, there is abundant redemption and he will redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. How amazing is that? That assurance that is there. And remember going kind of like where we looked at uh, when it comes to iniquities, look at what, what is in verse three. If you Lord should mark iniquities, who could stand? That's something that was already said in verse three. Now here at the end of it, it's kind of a repetition about that iniquity as well, but it's also one of those things that it's not said in the way of, I hope this is the case. These are saying, Israel, hear me when I say this, this is what we know. And so there's, there's an assurance. It's an imperative Israel. You need to know this and pay attention to it. So if you're the type that likes to be praying for the nation of Israel or whatever else, you could be praying this same kind of thing for the nation and for its individual pieces, the people who live there, those who are distant from God and, and are not acknowledging him, that they would be awakened to this truth. So here's how he ends this. Israel, hope in the Lord. And that hope is the expectation. It's the recognition that the Lord will deliver his people. And that's the hopefulness that's being spoken here. So it's that hope in him. Have this trust and faith in him, knowing that he will do these things. So it says, hope in the Lord. And here's why. Because with the Lord, there is mercy. And so, yeah, we understand what mercy is, that there may be things that that uh, men have done who uh, and, and their actions could very easily provoke God to some very, very unpleasant uh, outcomes. But here God desires mercy rather than judgment. We've known that from their history. So God would look at that and say, I don't want to see judgment. What I'd rather do is pour out mercy. The writer of the Psalms here recognizes that because, again, God's got a record of this. So this is the cry out to Israel. For with the Lord, there is mercy. And with him, there is abundant redemption. And so this abundance is kind of, it's this overflow. There's more than enough of it. This abundance, um, not only of, of mercy, but then also the abundance of redemption. And the redeeming is very simply um, in the spiritual sense. Sometimes it's in the physical sense as well of the bringing them back to the land, the redemption, the, the, the uh, way of, of taking them from where they were to, to where God wanted them to be. Now, redemption, as we would understand it, redemption is that something has a particular value and there's a cost for it. So the person who is redeeming it will pay whatever that cost is. And uh, so as far as God is concerned, as, and the person here, they recognize that God's merciful, that he's abundant in uh, in his forgiveness and all the things that that he is offering. But the, uh, the important part of this, that he's his redemption, he's willing to pay the price that is necessary for their redemption. Now, the law gave provision for the individual, the human, in the nation of Israel, if someone had become indebted, uh, there could be a person who would be the kinsman redeemer. Someone within their family could purchase back their land or do any number of things within the family that was of a redemption. Here, it looks towards the Lord as the one who is the redeemer, the one who pays what is necessary. For us in the church, boy, does it take on a whole different, a whole different uh, uh, picture because the price of redemption for sin was his blood. Jesus suffered and died and shed his blood so that we could have our sin forgiven. The fact that he raised from the dead showed that he conquered sin and death and gave to us the ability to have eternal life to be resurrected from the dead as he was. So there's two parts to it. Raising from the dead conquered death. Paying the price for sin was the, the, the blood was the, the cost of redemption. So the New Testament, boy, does this take on a whole different look. But redemption here in verse uh, seven is spoken of in the noun form. What is redemption? Something has a cost and the person who's redeeming it has to pay that cost in order to redeem it. Then you turn in verse eight and it says he will redeem Israel from its iniquities. Remember those iniquities that God, if he was to enumerate them, none of us could stand. But notice what he says here. He will redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. So the iniquities is the sin and the transgression. And it's God who will redeem them back, not their offerings. That's significant for us. So as the church is concerned, we look at this and we realize since Jesus has given himself for us, he's done something none of us could ever do. We would never be able to offer something that would redeem us from our sin. That could never happen. 
So it took God who, who moved towards man, not man towards God. He moved towards us and says, I offer to you my son who will pay the price for your sin if you will accept my offer. You don't have to do anything but trust me and believe. That's, that's the essence of salvation. Is that without precedent? Absolutely not. Remember Abraham. He was offering Isaac and it would have been in what is modern day Jerusalem. Okay, it was referred to as Mount Moriah. They had come from quite a ways from the south. It's several days. Actually, it says three days journey from what we would think is the area around southern Israel, Beersheba area, walking up to what is Jerusalem. And uh, that's where he would have been offering Isaac. And Isaac is bound. The altar is there. He's ready to sacrifice. And then the angel stops him before he does it. And ultimately, if you read that whole story, it says God will provide for himself the lamb for the the uh, offering or the ram for the offering. So this is where God says that it was it, his obedience was never in question. But God was not looking for for Abraham to sacrifice his son, though Abraham was willing to do it, knowing that he was the son of the promise. I'll sacrifice him because you're going to have to raise him from the dead or do something because God, you're the one who gave him to me and said he's the son of the promise. But now you're asking me to offer him. I'll do it obediently, even though I don't understand. That's where Abraham was. He's ready to offer up Isaac and God stops him. But notice again, the angel says God will provide for himself the offering. That's the important part. That was said 4,000 years ago from our perspective, 2,000 years ago, or 2,000 years from when God actually offered his own son on that same on, on that same mountain. Same Moriah is also Zion. Jesus was, was put to death outside the walls of the city in Jerusalem. Same place. Massively important that we understand this. And so the writer of, of the psalm here couldn't possibly have, have understood just how prophetic what their words were and how it was actually going to work, but pretty astounding. Psalm 131, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, nor do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed uh, and quieted my soul like the weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child my soul uh, is within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord for this time, from this time forth and forevermore. In the first part of this, it's the recognition of the writer here of just saying, I can do these things, but I won't because they just create all kinds of anxiousness. And then it turns in verse two about the, the kind of settled part of their heart, what it is in the way of the innermost person where the, the, the uh, first verse really kind of focuses more on the outward things and the busyness of things. And then verse three is like, you, you might want to do likewise. There's some incredible wisdom in this. And I really hope that we, as we read this as the church, should say, man, we really need to understand this. So the first part of it is it goes against human nature because it is one of those things with us as humans. We love to promote ourselves. We love to look at ourselves as somehow we are the, um, uh, the, the, the source for things being in a right state of things. We love to to use our intellect or somehow be able to take credit for making something take place. And it's just human nature. We, we want to try to fix things. For the most part, most people are like this. Other ones, they're just wired differently. But the garden variety human would love to be able to say, I've taken matters into my own hands and produced things. Now, here's what this writer says. This is referred to, though, this is credited to David. So it's a Psalm of David. So for him to be able to say this, pretty interesting because of the, think about the favor that there would be in this person, in David. He's the man of God's choosing. Um, it's referred, he's referred to as the man after God's own heart. So if ever there was a person who could probably, I guess you could say, uh, fall into the error of reading his own press clippings, David is that guy. So if somebody was to, to try to say, because of the favor that God has given to me, it would be easy for him to, to kind of take the accolades upon himself. I'm sure people fawned all over him. But this is his own self-assessment. Look at this. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. <clears throat> Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor the things too profound for me. So he mentions four things. Now, when he mentions his heart, once again, it's 
that which makes me who I am. When I when he looks in inwardly, the heart is is who he is as the individual. So he says, my heart is not haughty and haughty is just self exalted. So remember, in other places where he's spoken about this, he looks to the to the Lord to be the one who exalts him to who lifts him up, who who um, draws attention to him. David here says, my heart. And again, if you're saying this to the Lord, you might say this to people, even though it might not necessarily be true. David says this, Lord, you know me. And so if it wasn't true, first of all, he would never say this and God would never let him get away with it. So he says, and this doesn't mean that you don't fail in this at some times, but the overall part of your life, if the Lord was to look at you and say, you know, you're not really big in self-exaltation because you recognize who you ultimately are. Even if you stand above everyone else, when you stand before God, no one has the ability to be haughty or self-exalted. You don't come before the Lord and say, consider who I am, God. None of us do that. None of us should do that. Unfortunately, some do, but none of us should. If we genuinely understand who we are and who he is, you'll never do this. Lord, my heart is not haughty. It's not self-exalting, nor are my eyes lofty. It's nothing unrealistic. When I consider everything that I look around and I consider myself in the world in which I live, I'm not unrealistic in who I am. We're just made of dust. And from where we came from, there will we go as well. We are just broken sinners in need of redemption. David understood that. We should understand it now. The cost of that redemption and what it takes to be reconciled, that we know in a much different way than even they could have at the time. But David is realistic at this point. The third part of this, neither do I concern myself with great matters. The things that people love to debate. The people who think of themselves as these towering intellects and they will argue all kinds of just, you know, very fanciful things, very high minded and all the rest. David, I'm sure if if uh, if he wanted to and he depended upon the Lord, God could give him the ability to start working through all these great matters that people love to do. And so think the philosophers and the people who are always trying to come up with this, you know, these profound things. And David just says, yeah, I'm not going to concern myself with those things, with these great matters, nor things that are too profound for me. And the, the idea that it's just it's beyond me. It, they're too profound. I'm not going to try to go down the road of trying to figure out all the little small hidden kinds of things. And the reason we would, that he would say any of this or any of us as we read this and might think we want to be like that. Think about the reason for it. That will consume you. It would be better that I just be more humble in this way and say, if I'm consuming myself with that, where's there room for the Lord? These things are obstacles and David sees them as such. So I don't concern myself with that kind of stuff. It leaves up so much more room for the Lord to do what he might want to do. And it takes away our insistence on those things, which takes away from our time with the Lord. David was clearly a person who wanted to make sure that God had time in his life and he spent time with the Lord. But if he's worried about the high minded things, the lofty things, the, the stuff that's too profound for him, He's going to pursue that, and there's not the time to pursue the Lord. You've only got a finite amount of hours in each day. How profound is this? So it says, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Interestingly enough, this doesn't happen overnight. And I can tell you this from my early years as a believer, and I think anybody who's been a believer for any length of time, this is something that does happen over time because we have a repeating cycle. God has shown us these things. For David, there were those times that he probably wasn't like the weaned child, and he did concern himself with all of those kind of things. It brings nothing but anxiousness and wasted time and ultimately bad results because what you think is the right course turns out not to be. So this is really written from a, a place, I believe, of maturity. I certainly can say that because I've seen it in not only my own life, but others as well. The person that I was when I first got saved is not the person that I am now. Uh, much, much different. And that's only because God has just shown me so many things through the years. It's coming up on 40 years. It's hard for me to say. <laughs> It's coming up on 40 years since I got saved and the things that I have actually watched God do doesn't have you repeat the same stuff that you did in your infancy as a believer. So 
for David to be able to say this, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Now, the calming and the quieting of the soul is not because of some meditative, you know, kind of uh, some methodology. That's not what's being spoken of here. It's that idea. I'm not going to repeat the same cycle. I'm not going to fall into the what am I supposed to do and get anxious and all the rest of it. There's a ki- there's a quietness. It's like I've been here before. I've seen this. Human nature is to become anxious. I'm not going to become anxious. God has this under control. He's proven it time and time again. I'm not going to revert back to the same person that I used to be. So when he points back to the infancy of the weaned child that's mentioned here, and that he does so on a soulish level, we understand the child that needs the mother, that needs to nurse, man, you go from calm to berserk in a matter of moments because that child has not trained itself to realize not everything is a three alarm fire. But an infant knows this, knows one thing only, I want, and they're going to let everybody know that I want. And there's that freaking out that infants will have until they're given a bottle, until they're given, until the mother feeds them, however it may be, we get it. We understand this idea of, of being weaned versus not. The child finally gets to that point of realizing I, I don't have a reason. I don't need to freak out here. God will provide. Um, or the child will think mom will provide. Parent will provide. Here in David's case, the Lord will provide. So I've quieted my heart. It's not methodology. It's just a reminder. God has been there all along and he will provide as he has always provided. So this is the recognition that God is in control ultimately. Now, as he finishes this, like what we saw in um, the uh, in the previous uh, Psalm, the the turning to the nation, as you see in verse seven of Psalm 130. So we have here the same way. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time and forevermore or forever. So this hopefulness, again, is one of expectation. It's one of of recognizing that God has always and will always be the protector of the nation to those who trust him. So the call once again is to Israel. Consider what it is that God has shown me. May you also realize it and apply it to your own life as well. Once again, I'm not going to concern myself with those things that people usually concern themselves with because it will consume them. And David may very well look at this and say, there was a time when it used to consume me as well. But what God has shown me is that I can trust him because he knows better about what to do with those things. I'll trust and I'll wait on him. My hope is in him because he will reveal what his plan is going forward. You can see that there's a real maturity that's taken place in him. And the challenge to Israel and to us in these days when we read this, same thing. Will we become anxious? Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 4. We don't want to be anxious for things. We want to trust in the Lord, thankful, prayerful, making our requests known and letting God's peace kind of settle us in those kind of things. And then being careful to to observe, uh, you know, what he is doing, being thinking about those things that are positive, that are right, that are good, that are wonderful, not the stuff that caused us to be anxious in the first place. In fact, if you want to do that, go ahead and read um, Philippians chapter four. And uh, that that part that says, be anxious for nothing, compare it to what we see here as far as what David has written. And you'll notice that there's an incredible parallel, but with the person of Jesus put into the equation and how it works through the mind, it takes on such a different feel to it. So homework assignment, if you will, we'll look at it again next Monday. If our, if you have any questions about any of what's been shared here today, please contact us through the ministry's website and uh, the, the uh, drop down menu there in the contact us is the email. If you would like to uh, have any further explanation, if I've not really fully explained something, or if you have any questions of any kind, uh, you can always contact the ministry through the email, and uh, that is at oldpaththeology.net, and uh, love to be able to answer your emails. If you have any questions, please do uh, do uh, ask them through the email, and we will get together next Monday for uh, what will probably be the conclusion of the Psalms of Ascent, uh, 132, 33, and 34. We'll conclude this and then move our way through the rest of the Psalms. So we'll pick it up there next Monday.